Uh, so warm welcome to everyone. Great to have uh, so many of you joining. Um, how today's format is going to work is hopefully a lot of fun, super informal. David and I will have a chat for the first kind of 20 to 30 minutes, and then uh, we'll hand over the, the floor to you as the founders. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and if we have some time, you can raise your hand at the bottom of your screen, and then uh, we can bring you to the stage and uh, you can ask David uh, your questions. So why don't we get going? David, love just to hear about your story. Uh, pretty fascinating. Uh, why don't you take us through over the next kind of five minutes where it all began, where it started to, to where you are today? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I, I always kind of go back to the beginning of this story, which is, you know, when I'm in kind of middle school and um, I knew pretty early on, like I struggled with reading and writing and um, had to go to tutoring and all sorts of things because of uh, not being able to read. Um, and um, I quickly found a love for computers, one, um, and two, for, you know, entrepreneurship, right? Like, and that could, that was very small initially, like selling little things or whatever, but then building a small company for doing web design or whatever else, um, that quickly progressed through high school, right? So um, in high school, founded a company, um, worked with some of the very early companies in the 99 to 2000 time period uh, down on Wall Street in, in New York, um, which was kind of like where the internet companies were on, on Broad Street there. Um, and, you know, ultimately made the decision, like the only thing I wanted to do was build companies, right? Like I, I didn't want a job. Um, and I thought I was not going to go to college. I was like, all right, I, I found what I want to do. I'm just going to continue doing this, right? Um, luckily, my mom uh, convinced me that uh, I needed to go to college and it was probably a good choice. Um, but again, I was very set in that. And like, I only wanted to go to one college, Babson College, right? So the the, the best entrepreneurship program in the world um, for undergraduate and, and graduate, and they've continued to mature that program. Um, and I, I said, like, that's the only school I want to go to. So I invested all of my eggs in that one basket, right? Um, I don't know. I don't even remember if I applied to any other colleges, uh, and I was accepted to Babson, uh, on a wait list to start in the second semester. Right. So like, they didn't, they're like, we don't even really want you, but, uh, we'll take you because we know some people are going to drop out in the first semester. Right. Um, and, and great decision. Um, I, I, I loved my time there, but all that time was still running companies. Um, and, you know, found a real need for, um, what we later termed as a virtual phone system, but like the need at the time was very simple, which was I couldn't run a company by just answering my cell phone, right? Like, or home phone or whatever it was. Um, and I needed something that gave a more professional image, right? And that's where Grasshopper was born. Um, started that um, in, you know, kind of 2003 time frame. So graduated 2004, um, ran that company for two years while in school, um, continued to scale that and have done a lot of other things since then. But that's really where my journey began in terms of like a meaningful company, although prior to that had founded some other things and had been involved in raising capital, had done other things, but that wasn't my full time effort. Right. So like if you look back to return path, for example, I was in, on the original founding team, helped raise the capital, brought in a management team. But that was not a full time effort from my perspective. Um, so for me, the learning was much less during that period because of my time. Yeah, super cool. So it's 2003, you're uh, launching Grasshopper. What was the initial product? And uh, yeah, tell us about some of those frustrations, why why, why you decided to to go down this journey. Yeah, the original product was terrible. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I don't think we really cared very much. We just were selling it, right? Like we were just out there selling it any way we possibly could. Um, and to the point where like the original product had no backend CRM, like literally... Um, you know, if someone called for support, I would be typing in SQL statements to find the customer, right, in, in the database, right? So like, you know, that that's how little we invested there. But also the front end of the product was, was terrible. Um, we just pieced it together as quickly as you could. But we focused on the most important core aspect, which was the phone side of it, right? So like, if you look at the original product, it was all phone focused to the, to the point that we charged you more money, $10 a month, to even access it online, 
right? Like we said, this is a phone product. You had to do the setup on the phone, like by pressing keys and recording greetings and stuff. Obviously we migrated over time very quickly to a much more you know robust system. It was still not very good because I was still coding it and like, I'm not great, I'm okay, right? But like our focus from day one was sales, right? Like how do we create a marketing machine that is able to fulfill this, what we believe is demand, right? And we wanted to prove that demand very quickly. How did you get to the first uh, couple of hundred customers? I read in one of your interviews, $2 million in ARR in the first year, which is- Yeah, I think it, I think it was 1.8 or something like that. Yeah. I, I don't remember exactly, um, but we scaled pretty quickly because of that focus on, on marketing. Um, but I, I want to caveat that and pe people to understand that like in 2003, 2004, the marketing environment online was tremendously different, right? Like this was before AdWords. This was Omniture, right? Like the predece predecessor to AdWords, right? It's so like from a search intent perspective where you could buy clicks for a cent, right? So like the ability to test and scale is very different than it is today. The competitive environment was very different than it is today um, from a marketing perspective. Um, to the point that we were running like print ads in the back of, you know, Entrepreneur Magazine and Fortune. I don't know if you remember, but they had these like little classified ads um, back then that you could buy for $300, $500, whatever. And we would generate sales that way, right? Um, I don't know if you can do that today um, to convert someone from the magazine to the website to pay uh, at those rates. but like those marketing channels allowed us to, to get our original customers. Um, the key to our, you know, scaling success was definitely word of mouth, right? So if you look at our early customers, it was probably about 40% or more word of mouth referral uh, from a scaling perspective. Um, that then stabilized over time, even at scale to about 25%, right? So we relied on that very heavily. We built programs around it. And I'm happy to talk about some of our learnings there. Um, but at, at the highest level, one of the key learnings was not to incentivize people with money, right? It, it cheapened the offer um, where people wanted to genuinely refer a great service that they got value from. Yeah, let's dive into some of those learnings as we have quite a few SaaS founders here today. What were the metrics you focused on and why didn't you offer founders, why didn't you offer sorry, uh, referrers cash upfront? Yeah. So we did, we tried, right? Like we did, we tried everything possible. We were right. all about testing, right? So um, we were very early in on this AB testing before this was a thing. Um, and the software you had to use was tremendously expensive um, to, to do this type of testing. Now we can just all do it. So it's kind of expected. Um, but we, we AB tested everything, including our offers and our programs and, and such. Um, so you know, there, there were, so your first question was kind of metrics. So the key metrics we looked at from a company perspective were exceedingly simple, right? Uh, we, we broke that down into new customers, right? So like that was our key focus. How many new customers can we get, right? Um, we, we had a retention metric. We had a CPA metric. That was it. Like those were the three metrics that we drove people around. Now, obviously within departments, as we scaled and grew, people had metrics that rolled up to that and how that all related, right? If that was a cancellation percentage or call to completion for our customer service group or whatever it was, right? But like when you looked at the highest level metrics, it's new customers, it's retention and CPA. That's all that matters, right? Um, and uh, within there, there's some other things that, that matter for how that rolls up. Um, in terms of the actual referral program, uh, we tested everything from offers to give the referee or the referrer money, um, both, split, all sorts of things. The most successful across the board was just asking people for the referral at the right time and giving nothing other than a discount to you, the person that is signing up, right? So if I'm already a customer, I'm just asked at the right time and we figured out what those key moments were to ask for the referral. And we said, give your friend a $50 discount to sign up. That's it. That performed far better than us giving $50 to the referee, right? Wow. And this is, so, this is still 
2003, 2004, right? So still kind of old school media. How are you tracking? And I uh, learned you spent quite a bit of time and cash on radio. How, how are you tracking with this? Yeah, so we use the most simple approach. And I still believe in this approach today. Like there's all sorts of attribution models and metrics and first click and blah, blah, blah. blah. But I, I don't think any of those really matter, right? What, what we did is very simple. On the order page, how'd you hear about us? Drop down, that's it. Random order. Um, so we randomized the order. Uh, that's it, right? So like, it's not exact attribution, but what it tells you is the most important thing, which is, did you have lift from an activity, right? And you have to be very careful about the activities you do and how you measure, right? So you have to then break down activities into DMAs or into markets, right? To be, be able to figure this out. But then you have a baseline and you know what happens. And what's really interesting is people say, yeah, it's not accurate. Yeah, it doesn't matter as long as it's a consistent measure because then I know what my action taken was and the result, right? I know that lift percentage. That's all that really matters because if that works in one DMA or market, you test it in two or three. If it then proves out again, you can then expand that nationally or worldwide or whatever the, the, the segment is, right? Um, and when you look at the responses here, what's super interesting is people would say they heard us on TV when we never ran a television ad, right? So like, yeah, of course that, that, that it doesn't make sense, but that doesn't really matter, right? Because it's such a small percentage of people who do that. Um, and that's the way we tracked radio. That's the way we tracked everything. Um, and, and it worked tremendously well to break down those actions. Right. And so again, back in 2003, 2004, if you're open to sharing, what, what kind of numbers were you guys doing in terms of customers and, and revenue? Yeah. So, you know, in the first year, I think it was a million, five million, eight, whatever it was uh, in, in ARR um, and expanded pretty quickly. So we doubled or tripled the next year, doubled or tripled the next year. Um, so very quickly, we got to about $10 million um, and, and hit a plateau, right? And I, I think a lot of founders find this, right? And and I, it doesn't really matter what the number is. The plateau could be a million, it could be five, it could be 10, whatever. But you kind of hit this thing, right? And something happens, right? And usually it's the the organization or the company has outgrown the talent, you know, that exists, right? And, and we, we hit this plateau a number of times, but it's really scary because you sit there and you're like, oh man, I can't get customers at the same yeah. price. I can't, I can't scale. I can't do this. And we're like, have we got to this? Is the market not big enough? And all of these questions. And every time, as scary as it was, we got the answer like, no, we're, we actually have like a very small percentage of the market. And actually for our market, our, our market is continuously expanding, new businesses, new customers, new things. That's what mattered more than the total size, right? So like if you looked at the, the momentum or speed of which new companies are being created, that's what mattered for our segment. Um, and that continued to grow 2004, five, six, seven, eight, you know, kind of nine, 10, like continued to grow through that period. Um, and it, again, we hit that plateau at 20 million, like it happened again and again. And we had the same conversations. <laughs> like it was like duplicate conversation, just different numbers. Yeah. We see this with quite a few SaaS founders, right? I mean, uh, globally, uh, they do hit that plateau of, uh, kind of over time and every couple of years. How did you rectify that? And what were those conversations you had with your team? Because they must have been quite concerned as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the most important thing we found was at that first plateau, call it eight to 10 million, somewhere in there, um, we realized that there were a lot of mistakes we made in building the culture, the team, you know, the things we were doing. Because when you have high pay sales, it hides everything, right? Like, you could be an absolute disaster internally. You could have the wrong culture, the wrong people doing the wrong things. And you just, the scale and the speed hides it all, right? Um, and that's not good, right? So we learned that and we course corrected and we refocused down on culture, core values, purpose, all of those things, building a culture where and people where we wanted to be around every day. Um, so that was the first step in kind of getting over that, that hurdle. The other was just the realization that we had not gotten to market saturation, right? Cause like, that's the first thing people think, ah, there's just not more customers, whatever. Like that's the easy explanation. So we had to change our, our frame of mind. 
Um, and then the last piece I think was understanding that it's okay to outgrow team members, right? Like we thought originally being naive founders, like, oh, like we, the team's going to grow with us. The marketing, you know, director is going to become the this, this, and this, and keep like, sometimes you just outgrow that person and that's okay, right? It's a hard conversation to have with the individual, right? And you have to have an open and honest conversation, but it's okay, right? And the inverse of that is true as well. Like if the company has outgrown you as a founder, you have to be honest and open about that as well. And either find a place for yourself that fits skill set, scale, time, size, whatever, or remove yourself the same way you would remove a team member that the company is outgrown. Yeah, love to discuss this. So let's jump into talent. Um, so the couple of questions here, what was the culture you guys integrated kind of halfway, I guess, through the journey? Um, and what were those principles? Yeah, so the culture that we had originally was just kind of haphazard. It was, right. you know, <laughs> the, the first few people we hired obviously had our, you know, core values and core purpose um, without being spoken as founders because we hired them. But as the team hired and we didn't have those things written down, communicated, part of systems and processes that, you know, kind of got weaker and weaker over time, right? Um, so the, what, what we put in place and we developed over time was our core purpose was empowering entrepreneurs to succeed, right? So like we were very specific in our target customer, right? Who we want to help, but not what we're doing. Right. Like core purpose, like why do I come to work and get excited had nothing to do with selling a phone system or doing the things that we do. Um, it had to do with making our entrepreneur customers lives better. Right. Um, the, the, the core values are like how we do things um, spelled out, Gary, go above and beyond, always entrepreneurial, radically passionate and your team. Right. And this was then integrated into everything we did, performance, rewards and recognition, uh, you know, hiring, firing, uh, absolutely everything um, to the point that I used to ask people like, you know, if they came into the office, I were in a conference room, like I'd say, look, if you don't believe me that this is part of our culture and our life here, go ask any person out in the office, the core values, and at least one story for one of the values. And I guarantee you, everyone can do it, right? That's pretty cool. And, and that was the power of what we built over kind of a two-year period. How did the company change, right? I mean, you spoke earlier about um, having those tough conversations with the non-performers. What were those conversations? And founders who are here today who maybe have similar people on their team who they have to have those conversations at some stage, how would you go about doing it? Yeah, I think it's always tough conversations. You know, our preference is always uh, direct, open, and honest, right? Like we we don't we don't dance around the issue. We're, we're direct, open, and honest about it every time. Um, and it's really looking at two key metrics, right? Like where does someone sit on the performance track, right? And we rated people A, B, C, right? Every quarter on each of these two metrics. Um, so performance one, culture two. Those are the only two pieces, right? Like there's lots of other ways. We had all sorts of performance tools and all sorts of things and goals and roll-ups, and blah, 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 blah. It didn't really matter, right? Like if, if you were rated below an A in any of those categories in two quarters, there was a conversation, right? There was usually a conversation the first time it happened, right? But like systematically, there was definitely a conversation in the second quarter, right? So like we reduced that time frame as much as possible um, to be having ongoing conversations compared to the last conversation, because that's not fair to, to the employee or to the company, right? Um, the most difficult people to have conversations with are A, performers, and C, culture, hmm. right? Like, these are the people that you're like, oh, man, if I get rid of David, like, this thing's going to fall apart, or whatever story I tell myself, right? Like, I'm going to be less productive. This is going to break. He has in institutional knowledge that no one else has, whatever, right? But he is terrible for the culture. He's toxic, uh, whatever the things are, however you define it or rate it, right? Like those are the most difficult conversations because you can't walk in and say, look, it's clear performance is terrible, whatever, right? It, performance has been great. <laughs> mm. um, 
so, you know, some of those people self-select out because they're uncomfortable in the culture naturally, but some of them don't. And, and those are hard conversations. Um, my key learning there is consistently like the stories that we tell ourselves are never true in terms of how important that person was, that they only had knowledge that no one else had, that whatever it is, like when you rip the bandaid off, everyone else is like, thank you. Finally, they, they did this. And it works itself out pretty quickly. Mm. I guess like on the other side, right? Those top performers, it's expensive to keep the best performers. How how did you keep them? Because you didn't, did you offer stock options in, in the early days? No, we never did. So we, we actually never offered uh, stock options or equities. So like we were the, the, the inverse of, of Silicon Valley, right? Um, and, you know, not just to be contrarian, but like we had a very specific reason. Like we said to people, look, like our intention as founders is not to sell this company. We're building something great that we want to be at and we have no exit plan. Like we are very clear about this throughout the hiring process through, you know, our communication with people top to bottom, like we have no exit plan. And that, that, that for us was a positive, not a negative where people are like, you have to, but no, we do not want to exit this, right? So if I sell you on some idea that I'm going to give you equity in something I'm not going to exit, that's not really fair, right? Mm -hmm. Because like I'm selling you something that has no value. So I understand that you've been told to make sure you get equity and hear all these things or whatever. But I, what I'm saying is I will overpay to market salary, um, have a very generous bonus program and not do equity, right? So our bonus program then developed and matured over time to be kind of a replacement for equity paid forward, right? So when I say that, meaning like it's not a bonus or a Christmas bonus, I hate holiday bonuses. Like I think they should be deleted from every company because um, that's entitlement. This was very specifically based on performance and it wasn't profit sharing. What we built was a pool that the company funded and then you had equity in that pool, right? Meaning like rather than profit sharing, th this really was we as a company can make decisions together and we may overfund this year or underfund to buy growth or whatever decisions we make as a management team and as a total company, right? But like some of these bonuses were very large, upwards of 30, 40% of salary. It's pretty amazing. Um, the talent world has changed a lot, <laughs> right? Since you guys first started. I mean, we had COVID uh, a couple of years ago. So um, quite a few companies started offering from the work. What are your thoughts on this? And do you think if Grasshopper was to begin now, would you all be in person or would you offer flexible work? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm a huge proponent of remote work and have been doing it for more than 15 years now. Um, so if you, actually almost 18 years, I think. Um, so if you look back, so Grasshopper was in person. Um, we then had hybrid where we had a second office in Texas. Um, we tried other things, but Grasshopper technically was in person. Um, we also built Chargeify. Um, that was 100% remote, built within Grasshopper. So separate team, all remote. Um, to the point that like this was before Zoom was even semi-reliable. Like we we wanted to be on video communication all day and we used PlayStations um, to do it because their platform was far more reliable. Um, so each of us had a PlayStation um, in our offices uh, or homes or wherever we were. Um, so that was a team of seven people or so. Um, I, I would, so all companies we build now are remote, like a hundred percent. I think the key is it has to be one or the other. The The worst solution is hybrid. Some people in an office, some people remote, right? Like if you want to go in, all in on in an office, that's fine. There's lots of very successful companies, no problem, right? And I still believe you can get great talent doing that. If you want to go all in and remote, you have to go all in on it. Like mm. there's no in between. Super interesting. Cool. Um, we're about halfway through, so why don't we jump to capital? Uh, you guys never raise, right? Uh, Grasshopper? Yeah. Yeah. So so we never raised uh, capital, um, including all the way up to exit. Um, in our last kind of two years, we did take some uh, debt from SVB uh, to fund 
uh, radio because that was a $12 million purchase. Right. Like just, we, we couldn't forward fund that, right? So uh, we, we had to take some debt, but yeah, we had no external capital at, at all. Why? So, I mean, one, when we started, we, we probably just didn't have the forethought to say that maybe we need it. We were just kind of like, no, let's just build this. So it was like the, in, the easy thing in our mind was like, just build it um, and, and cobble it together. Two, like we wanted to build something that, that we owned and we controlled, right? So like not other people making decisions for us. And I think the key area this proved out most importantly with Grasshopper was we had funded competitors in kind of year three, four, and five. Um, all of them ended up in two, two areas. One, voice over IP. We never did this. Um, we believe this to be a commodity market with prices going down, down, down over time. And I think that proved out to be true. Um, two, they had to go up market, right? So they, they had to, th those were the two things. We didn't want to do either of them. And our independence from capital, I think, allowed us to say no to that and, you know, perform very well in a very difficult market, micro SMB, very hard to do. Um, but, but that's where we succeeded. And if you look at the exits, so uh, one of our funding competitors, Ring Central, um, and, and our exit, right? Um, the, the, the numbers are very different, right? From a total perspective. However, um, as founders, we did 10x, 20x, 50x better um, than the founders of, of Ring Central, right? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the returns to us were outsized um, compared to the founders of Ring Central that raised more capital and went IPO. But does that matter, mm -hmm. right? Outside of press, does that matter from a rewards perspective? I don't know. Mm -hmm. This is maybe a good time to ask, um, how would you, what advice would you give to founders raising and when should they, especially those building SaaS companies? Yeah, so uh, I, I think for SaaS, I, I, there is no reason to raise before you have a million dollars AR. Like the, the tools, systems, processes, all the stuff that exists today is so cheap and available that if you can't get to a million dollars AR without capital, I would question product market fit significantly. Now, there are some caveats in that, like if there are very high capital costs because you need specialized equipment or things that you can't get or whatever, yeah, there, there are edge cases, right? But let's talk about the most in the middle, right? Um, and then the other edge case being like speed to market. If there is a real first mover advantage, which I don't believe exists in more than a few industries in the world, um, and actually, if you go back and look at it, it's actually third, fourth, fifth mover who are the big winners, right? It's it's not the first mover, especially in SaaS, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think raising after a million dollars ARR um, and having a break-even or profitable engine, right? Because that gives you optionality both in the raising process, but also in the control process, the decision-making process, all of those things. Like those are the two metrics that I think are most important. Yeah. And for those founders who do want to go and raise, you know, pre-seed round before the million dollars era, you also do quite a bit of investing, right? So what, what do you think founders get wrong, especially when raising for SaaS companies? Yeah. So first of all, I do do investing, but I only invest after a million dollars in ARR. <laughs> oh, really? That's the caveat. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, I do apply this to, to my thesis, um, and, you know, so I think that, so to your question, what, what do founders get wrong? Um, I, I think they worry too much about uh, at the early stage where the capital is coming from. Um, there is very little, if any, smart capital at that very early stage. Like I, I know that there is accelerators and I like them and they're fine and they provide value. I, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, but generally the capital just doesn't matter source where in A and B rounds, name brand matters, leader matters, you know, who's going to be on the board. There are other metrics that matter more, right? So I always advise people the best way to raise capital early is build a small advisory group um, that are people that may add value, but not guaranteed um, and have some touch towards your industry. Um, and it's going to be a bunch of small checks, 
right? Like, I think that's the way you get there and you build momentum, right? Like, hey, David invested, Ollie invested, and you start building this momentum in a very short cycle. Like, that's the way to close early. Yeah. I love the point you mentioned around finding the best advisors. We actually have an operators network uh, of 400 plus operators who come from SaaS companies, marketing companies. So uh, for the founders who are listening today, uh, you also have a massive asset to use, right? And hopefully they can help you with so, so many of those zero to one challenges and help you get to that ARR. Um, cool. Why don't we jump to uh, brand marketing? I learned quite interestingly, you guys cha changed your name, right? Um, from Gold Female to Grasshopper, like halfway through the journey, what happened? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, Gold Female was a terrible name. Um, it's not so the I spent, best. I will be yeah, honest. <laughs> I spent half my life spelling it out because people thought it was G O V, like Gov, like who, who, right. lots of things, right? But like you know, when we started, we we had very little thought of branding because we were all about like direct sales marketing. Like we're like, it doesn't really matter. We're not. We're, we weren't building a brand. We were like, let's just sell something, right? Um, it, we quickly realized two, two key things. One, brand matters within this segment. Um, so it's not enterprise. It's not a hidden brand. It's very public. It's forward facing. And really what we were was almost a direct to consumer brand, right? Like if you look at our marketing, our tactics, all the things that we did, we were a direct to consumer brand selling to micro SMBs, right? Um, so, so brand matters. Um, two, we did a lot of offline advertising. And I think this matters even more here, especially on radio, right? So like the key attributes when we thought about name were, is it easy to spell, right? Um, is it short enough? Uh, because otherwise you spend 15 seconds of a 30 second ad spelling out where the domain name is, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Like just, just simply. Um, so we spent a, a lot of time internally and we, we, we decided on this brand internally and did not use an outside agency uh, to do it and uh, got lucky and were able to get the, the .com. We had to buy it, of course. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't that expensive. I think it was $25,000, uh, something like that. Um, Cause it wasn't held by a domainer. It was just a, a random person that we had to chase down. Um, but if you think about like how that then played out in radio ads, it's, it's almost impossible for someone to misspell grasshopper, right? Like you could, you could miss an S by mistake or a P or something like that. Like that's possible, but it's not because you didn't know how to spell it. Right. Um, so like it, it met all of our metrics. There was very little branding around it. There was a, 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 a mower company, like a lawnmower company. Um, and then the, the other competitor uh, was the wiki page for like the insect, <laughs> right? right? <Yeah. laughs> so, so like between those two, we felt that we could own that presence and, and ultimately we did. And we ranked higher than the Wikipedia page for the term wow. grasshopper, right? So we invested a lot in SEO um, to, to accomplish that, but also very strong profile across all of our core keywords. Um, but brand then became very important as we continued to scale. Um, and I'd say too, in, in the exit process, this then translated through and we said like, we, we want someone who's going to maintain our brand, right? Like we didn't want an acquirer and we didn't seek out an acquirer. We can talk about that process, but we didn't, we were not going to say yes to anyone who would say, this is going to become some other name. This is like, we wanted that brand to exist and to maintain. Cool. This is maybe a good time to talk about the uh, acquisition, which is probably why uh, some people are joining today. So you guys have been going, what, uh, I think 10 years by this point, maybe 12 years. 12, uh, yeah. A couple of people come knocking. Let's just, yeah, let's talk about the acquisition, what what happened and how did it come yeah. about? Yeah, so uh, I have some contrarian thoughts here too. Uh, but so, so the process for us was like, we had no expectation to exit at all. Um, and we had been, people were reaching out for, you know, all of the 10 years, right? Um, from VCs to acquirers to whatever else, right? To the point that we said, like our typical response to anyone reaching out was like, thank you for the outreach. Um, if you're not a partner, have one of your partners in your firm contact us because we don't talk to anyone else, right? Like, so you need to be listed on the webpage as a partner at whatever firm it is, or thank you, right? Um, so that eliminated a lot. 
Um, and we had conversations over time. Like we talked to VCs, we talked to acquirers and had deep conversations about what that looked like. And, you know, really didn't like the responses, like sat in meetings where like, you know, what we think is you should go up market and you should do voice over IP because that's what mm, we're, we're going to stop here. Uh, this is not a good fit for us from a partnership perspective. Um, so a lot of no's. Um, then someone reached out from, from Citrix, um, someone I knew who uh, Citrix acquired his company and said, hey, like we want to have a real conversation uh, about what you guys are doing. That was it. I was like, okay, like we've had lots of these conversations. You're a friend. Well, we'll have the conversation. Um, they said, you know, we want to, we want to buy the company. Um, we said, no, it, it's not the right time. It's early. We have a plan. We know what we're going to do. We expect to execute on this plan. Come back to us later. Um, they came back to us uh, two quarters later. Uh, we executed on that plan, beat the plan. Um, they said, look, like we've made 25 plus acquisitions and we've had these conversations hundreds of times. We've never once had someone meet or beat their plan um, when they said, come back to us. So they're like, now we definitely want to buy you. So, so, so that conversation, you know, deepened and, and ultimately we did have a transaction with them. Um, but it, where I'm contrarian is like, it was not a process. One, it was not a competitive bidding or any of these things. Like we found a partner that happened to reach out to us was the right fit, right? Like we defined what right fit meant not just dollars, right? Like obviously structure and dollars matter. What's an escrow? What's not? Is it earn out? Is it not? And ultimately it was no earn out. It was all cash, very low escrow, like all the things we that, that were important on a structure side, but there were other things that were highly important. Brand, is it going to maintain? Is it going to be eaten up and disappear? Um, what happens with the team? Is this, you know, where you think that you get cost savings from duplication and then our whole team is gone? Not okay with us, right? Like, what is our expectation for founders to stay on or not stay on? We did not stay on, right? So like we we literally transaction closed, next day gone. That, that was it. Um, so like those things became the much more important metrics. So Citrix so acquired you guys, I think $170 million, give or take. You and your partner, I think, had something like 90% of the company, uh, again, like give or take. The there must be so much going on in the company, just on the growth side and the sales process, right? How, how are you staying focused? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, it's very always difficult to, through an acquisition process to stay focused. And I think that's where people make mistakes because they get so wrapped up into it. They slip up on the sales and marketing. And then the acquirer takes advantage of that and said, you missed targets or whatever. We We were very careful about this. We created a separate group and team to work on the acquisition process where the rest of the company continued to operate. Like we, we tried to divide out as much as possible. And at the latest stage, right before closing, that just isn't real. Like everything kind of happens and it isn't. But in the earlier process where there's more risk, we tried to, to keep that separate as much as possible um, and communicated early and often to everyone like, this is not a done deal, right? Like, do not assume this is happening. Assume that we are building this company as we have for the past 12 years, right? And we communicated that to absolutely everyone, right? It, we, once it was public, that we public within the company, right? Um, and I think that was key, right? Because people understood like, until this is signed and there's a check, this is not happening. Yeah. And so day two happens with the acquisition and you're out. Yeah. How do you feel like the more around the sentimental values, right? It's like your email address down, mm -hmm. I guess, gets switched off or you no longer have access to I know, the data, right? What, what, what's going on? Yeah. I mean, emotionally, it was very difficult. Right. Like so there's, there's two factors. One is the logistics, like literally have to figure out a new email address for something I've used for 12 years, <sighs> um, like every login, like everything. And obviously I had some transition time. It wasn't like turned off, but like, had to figure that out very quickly, like order of magnitude a week. Um, so so that, that was logistically, but emotionally, after being the guy running Grasshopper for 12 years, like everything I talked about, that's what people knew me as, like all of those things just changed. Like I was no longer that. And like, I didn't know how to answer, what do you do? Like, I'm like, I don't, I don't know, I, I, I used to do this. Like it was a very awkward time. 
to figure that out. So emotionally, you know, very, very difficult. And I did not expect that. You went from being known as the grasshopper guy, I guess, to to what? Just David? Oh, no, just David. Uh, right. And, you know, it took, took a few years to struggle and figure out what that meant, right? And um, be okay with not being tied to a single company, right? Like what I do today is across a number of different companies. Um, so, you know, kind of people ask at a party, what do you do? Like, I, I, I'm like, I, I used to run a technology company. Like, because I, I really want the conversation to go away because that's not a meaningful conversation, right? A meaningful conversation has nothing to do with what I do or what you do, right? Like, let's have a conversation about what our passions, our interests, the things that get us excited, right? Like, what we do doesn't really matter. Yeah, I love all of this. Um, well, first of all, thanks so much for your time. We'll we'll get some questions coming in, and we do have quite a lot coming in. Um, so if anyone who's got any questions, feel free to put them in the in the chat, raise your hand, or uh, put them in the Q and A, and we can and we can go to them. Uh, maybe before that, what's what's keeping you busy now, and what are your passions today? Yeah. Um, so uh, I've been quite busy with YPO Young Presidents Organization as a volunteer on the board and building a Formula One event. Um, with them this year. So that's taken up a lot of my time. Uh, on the business side of things, um, raised a lot of capital for a uh, SaaS company, Vanilla. Um, that team is uh, more than 100 people now, and um, the company continues to scale. Uh, so that's kind of lessened on my time now as I step back from that company. Um, I run a, a, a small fund that does uh, real estate acquisitions for short-term rentals, Airbnb. Um, I write a weekly newsletter um, that, that I spend quite a bit of time thinking about and researching and reading and, and doing things like that. Um, that, that kind of a lot of my time and still own a number of different companies, um, in the, the direct to consumer space, perfect keto, uh, a keto brand is supplements and snacks. Um, we own, uh, uh, an Invisalign practice. Like there's a bunch of other things across that, but they take up a lot less of my time. Do you think you'll go back to building another company like Grasshopper or? Do you have another company in you? Yeah, I I, I think so. Um, I just have to find what what brings me happiness, and you know I think adds value to the world, right? Like I think that there's a proliferation of of SaaS companies that are just duplicates of what's available, um, and that that doesn't excite me, right? And so you know thinking about what's actually going to add value is important, um, which is why at Vanilla. You know, we built something brand new. Like this was not an industry that existed. You know, software around estate planning um, and, and this whole kind of segment within financial services. Um, now a bunch of companies have popped up after we raised, you know, more than forty million dollars. Um, but you know, that that to me was very interesting and why I spent time building it. Cool. Hey, we have a couple of questions uh, around talent. One of the questions is, as a SaaS company, what are the first four to five hires I should focus on? Yeah, so I don't, it's hard to say without knowing the context, right? Um, my, the, the most important learning that I've had here from a hiring perspective is less about which people necessarily, right? Like, is it go to market? Is it this or whatever? I think it's, you should do every job yourself until you can't. And then hire to fill either your skill gaps or time gaps, right? And we did this early on because then I knew exactly the type of person I was hiring. I wasn't writing a job description based on something someone else told me or whatever. I was like, at this company, this is what a customer service representative does because I have done it for the last six months, right? I have answered the tickets, the phone calls. I've done every piece of it, right? And I can tell you exactly what this job entails. I can tell you where I made mistakes. You can come in and tell you that I did it all wrong. That's fine. But I know what the inputs are and I know what the outputs need to be, right? Um, and that I think is the more important question to ask about hiring in the early stages. Yeah, that was actually the second question which came in and uh, we didn't ask it earlier. Um, you mentioned that in quite a few of your interviews that you did all of these jobs yourself as well, right? You and your partner for the first six months. Why was that so important to you personally? I think it's a learning thing um, and also a deeper understanding, right? Like um, I, I use customer service as, a, as an easy example here, but like answering those tickets 
gives the ultimate understanding of the customer needs, the problems in the software, the things that are working, the things that are not working is like the most honest look within a company, right? And it's sometimes the most painful, right? Because people are brutally honest and you have to understand when to filter people out and who's complaining and the value of customers and all the different things, right? But if you want the most brutal opinion, it's customer support tickets. And, you know, we, we did phone support from day one and still the grasshopper still does it nowhere close to as good as we did it. Um, but we, we did this in the U S full-time employees. Um, we tr spent a tremendous amount of money on 24 by seven phone customer service. And that is even more brutal than, than tickets, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because there's like a filter that happens in tickets and it's not a live person. Um, so like, you know, even in the last, like right when we left Grasshopper, we had a program that every single manager had to take customer calls every week, right? Now the time we had to reduce because you, you can't be spending very expensive people's time and all that stuff, but like that connection was very important. So we did two things. One, people listened into calls. Two, they actually took calls with the assistance of an agent to actually help them do the CRM aspects or whatever. Um, but we also did welcome calls and we, we called up new customers. So every manager and everyone in the company, including developers and everyone else was assigned 10 customers a week that they had to call up and say, I saw you signed up. Do you have any questions? Like magical things happened when developers called a brand new customer who happened to be struggling with something like that got fixed really fast. <laughs> right. That's pretty small. Um, so like that connection was really important. And that was because we understood that doing the jobs ourselves adds value. What kept you up tonight on the other side? <laughs> you got uh, so much all, going on. I mean, all sorts of things, n n not making payroll, uh, you know, vendors, I mean, all sorts of problems and mistakes, um, rebuilding the software three different times and investing millions of dollars into doing so because we made mistakes, wrong hiring, um, you know, all, all of the things you would expect to keep us up at night. Um, but none of it mattered because it was all outweighed by the joy that we got from building something we loved. Yeah, I love that. And when you guys saw, did you distribute some of the funds to the, the, the team who have been quite low? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we we carved out a significant portion of proceeds. So we owned almost the entire company um, and we carved out a significant portion, um, distributed that to the management team and then distributed to the entire team, um, plus set up an additional structure with the acquirer for extremely large retention uh, bonuses um, that, that equated to another $15 million, I believe, um, or, or so. Uh, when you looked at that. And um, so people that wanted to stay on had that opportunity. Amazing. Um, we probably have time for one more question. And you probably get the same question all the time. What's the advice you get to founders? But let's maybe change that. Um, if you go to back to day one of starting Grasshopper, what would you change differently? Nothing. Um, so <laughs> so I, I actually don't like looking back, right? So. We, we made lots of mistakes. There were lots of problems, things that I would like to be different. Um, but one of my personal core values is the journey matters, right? And when I think about that, like part of that means that you, you don't look back and say, I wish this or I wish that because I wouldn't be here today without those, without those challenges or problems or successes, right? And that the, the journey itself is more important than the outcome. Um, and that's a personal core value, right? So I, 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 tr I live that every day. Very cool. Well, hey, uh, the founders have loved this. We've had a lot of founders joining in. So thanks so much for your time. We've really uh, loved this. Uh, super cool story. And can't wait to have you back next time. Uh, thanks to everyone who's joined. And uh, yeah, we'll catch up soon. And thanks so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.